Margarita Patton says, first and foremost, to me, durability, a lady of great standing, a lady who's seen things come and go, and is still there, and still has to be listened to. You see, you don't listen to her, she'll make sure that you listen to her. Great strength of character. My first impression of her before she'd said anything was, despite old age, an enormous amount of kind of power. Um, and that was kind of the minute she walked through the door, I went, this is going to be someone who I know I'm going to find incredibly interesting. And the kind of dynamism comes out of her. You know, the, the first real memory that I have of my mother is that she must have been in a box somewhere. Be an actress when you I were young. I had this dream. We didn't do much acting at school, but I would be an actress. And people who say, oh, "Yes, dear," everybody has dreams like that. But I also was very good at cooking from the very beginning. I seemed to have this instinct, so I decided to be a home economist in industry, because the people pointed out I could cook. And if I couldn't stand on a stage platform, I could stand on a platform somewhere. <laughs> so I was going to get the best of both worlds. But when I began to earn a little bit of money, I read that Wada offered a scholarship. So there I was, Hartford. Now, I've always been lucky in the people who've helped me. Of course, everybody was horrified. Leaving a good job like that when you're going to do, you're doing so well. They use the same phrase. They used it with my brother when he wanted to go to see your poor widowed mother. And it was my poor widowed mother who said, take it, grab it. If you don't do it, you'll spend the rest of your life thinking, if only. My mother had a very large garden and was a very imaginative lady. And we would be like these fine black currants, raspberries, plums. Well, they were cheaper, you see, but she was widowed when I was 12. My brother was nine and my sister was four. So money was very important. She went back to teaching. She was an English mistress. But she was a very keen gardener and her gardener ha garden had to pay. And it paid by us having sliced plums or whatever was there. Why spend money on expensive tomatoes when she got all that growing in the garden? And I used to hate her salads as a child because people used to say to me, Oh, doesn't your mum make funny salads? And even grown ups used to say, Very unusual things then. But we got used to it and, and in, the, in the end became proud of it. But it was she who said that. And the fact in the Ministry of Food, you expect to have a great diversity of vegetables on your plate. That was second nature to us. We'd had it for years and years and years. So, see, I had an unusual beginning with a very unusual mother. Well, if you've only had one mother, I don't think you know what it's like to grow up with anybody else. Uh, I don't think I was overly aware of anything strange, quite frankly. I was lucky enough to have the most superb nanny because my mother had to go back to work very quickly um, and I don't remember very much conversation about food. Uh, I don't remember anything very much full stop. I was the only child so I was the only one that could get into trouble. Uh, if I was called Darling, life was fine. Um, if I was called Judith, life was not so good. Um, so yes, she was a fairly cut and dry. So I had seven or eight months in repertory at Oldham, twice nightly. And if you want to know how to work hard, you go into twice nightly rep. Um, and then the, the season ended and there were four months before it started. Now I haven't been on a stage long enough to talk about resting. I was talking about being out of work, which was very much more down to earth. And I said to my late chief, hi, I've got to earn some money before April. And she set the tone of my further education. She said, well, you're always very good at selling, Marguerite. Why don't you apply to the refrigerator people? 
they are looking for people. There was a great shortage of homes with refrigerators in the, the, the late 30s. They're looking for people to help sell refrigerators. Why don't you apply? And again, luck. My letter of application coincided with Frigidaire, the greatest name at the time of refrigeration, added in the Times and Telegraph for a senior home economist. Well, no way could I be called senior. I was the most junior, junior home economist. And so I got caught up in that. But you see, I'd spent six or seven months in repertory, putting on hats that didn't exist, lying on beds that weren't there until Tuesday or, or when the dress rehearsal was. So when they asked us to give a demonstration, I was back in repertory. And I could give a demonstration without a table, without a refrigerator, without a mixing bowl. <laughs> and to everybody's surprise, including mine, I got the job. And I went home to tell my mother I was receiving the highest salary I'd ever heard of anybody in the electrical industry. It was stress that because I represented Frigidaire, I would travel first class everywhere and I would stay at the very best hotel. Of course, my mother had more conscience than me. She said, Dolly, you can't do that. You intend to leave in April. Well, we'll see when April comes. And when April comes, I was having such a good time, enjoying what I was doing. So I, t I talked to myself and said, look, Marguerite, you've got to choose. And I thought I'd rather be a top-grade home economist than an out-of-work young actress. So that's when I changed. <laughs> Then call up came, and again I was awfully lucky. I met the recruiting officer for the RAF in Lincoln, and his wife was quite a well-known actress. And he said his poor wife hated coming to Lincoln because no one was interested in the stage. Now I could be, see me and unknown <laughs> ex secretary so we became great buddies. And he said, when the call-up comes for you, if you don't particularly want to go into the WEF, and I didn't. He said, volunteer. I said, what? He said, volunteer. Because if they can't give you what you want, you can get out. Because the Ministry of Food wanted me. They'd already told me they wanted me, but they couldn't do anything about it. I got to do it myself. So when I rang them up and said, here I am, so what? Now, over the years, introductions have been messed around. Marguerite Patton, advisor to the Ministry of Food, never heard such nonsense. I was very young. I was really still very inexperienced. And I was one of the top grade home economists throughout the whole of this country. And we were home advisors, exactly what the name suggests. Don't lecture. Lure people, please people, give them what they want if it's possible. And so we will, uh, 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 had to give people recipes for children's parties. We didn't say, oh, we can't have a party, that's a war. We'd say, yes, that'd be lovely, now what can I do to help? Because our opening remark always was, what have you got? And we'd start working from what have you got and go on from there. So by January 1940, when rationing came in, there were two great advantages. One is the First World War rationing ended in February 1921. 21 to 40, 19 years. So people like my mother remembered everything about him. See, so that was a great advantage. The second advantage was we'd had time to prepare stock up the few tins of the corned beef if you can get them, but don't be greedy. But do look out for things that keep, that might be useful. I think, I think there's a lot of relevance to, um, for today. I think her kind of values on, on kind of waste and care and doing things slowly and thoughtfully, um, I think are very relevant to today. And also some idea that in the current crises of, of feeding 
the globe that we have at the moment that um, maybe rationing is something that we might again see in our lifetimes. I don't think that though she'd, um, she doesn't suffer fools lightly. I got a few ticking offs from her for not cutting, um, for cutting too much of the top off a carrot. And of course Margaret was very strong in the last world war because she helped organise, as I understand it, diets and recipes on awful budgets. Uh, and probably we might even be using all her recipes again in the next few years. Who knows how that's going to be. But she actually used food to its best. She took uh, cheaper cuts. She wasn't frivolous with money, but she made them taste as they should taste. The first things that came in were bacon, meat and butter. Bacon or ham, I should say, either or. And the butter ration was 50 grams, 2 ounces. And the bacon or ham ration was 115 grams, 4 ounces. The meat ration, and people can never quite understand that, was not rationed by weight. It was rationed by price. You were allowed one and twopenny worth of meat per person per week. And if I want to stress what that buys, I gently take one lamb chop with me. That would be your ration for a week. But because it's price, if you bought cheap mince meat, you get more. Mm. So it's up to you to use your money wisely. As the war went on, we didn't have one and twopenny worth of fresh meat. We had a shilling's worth of fresh meat and two penny worth of corned beef. Cheese, 50 grams, two ounces. But if you were a vegetarian, you would have 12 ounces, 350, and give up your meat ration. If you kept chickens, you would not have one egg per week or fortnight if you were unlucky. You would have a means of feeding those chickens, but you'd have to give up. Now, don't ask me how much you have to give up, because I never get chickens. Mm. You'd have to give up a certain amount of the eggs you produce. But, but we got used to it. What would the beginning of June mean to most of us? We'd have a fresh tomato. I mean, if you think you didn't see them for six months, mm. you bottled them. That's the same as canning. You could have cat the nose for, uh, for cooking, but it was a fresh tomato you craved for. I quoted uh, raspberry jam sandwiches, and the audience looked a bit amazed, and I said, if you had one pound, 450 grams of preserves per eight weeks, wouldn't fresh raspberry sandwiches be the treat? Dried egg was very much better and many people remember it. If you were imaginative with it, you've only got to analyse the fact that it's whole egg, it's not an invitation at all, and use it wisely, you'll be all right. <music> Philip Harbin came before me. People forget that, and I won't let them forget it, because he did such sterling work. I started in radio and I did quite a few of those kitchen front broadcasts. Then when Woman's Hour came on, they were looking around. Oh, Marguerite Patton, she's very good at radio. Let's have her on there. And from the, the, that was 1936, 1947, they were starting a woman's program. We want a resident cook. Who shall we have? We'll ask Marguerite. Well, you see, I've spent a lifetime almost, a very short lifetime, giving demonstrations to the public. So to appear in front of cameras didn't do anything to me. Mm. I was just giving a normal demonstration. It was nothing special at all. So I then moved on to television. And you've got the answer there. And so I was towed around a bit more. So I got direct experience of what was going on by going in the old days of Alexandra Palace and seeing the big, big cameras, they had to move backwards and forwards and into these tiny little sets. And so being aware that she was doing something, but again, not really comparing notes with anybody to find out what their mother did. She knew how to attract an audience, hold an audience, educate an audience, wow them and then just... I think I was termed the assistant to the assistant stage manager. When she was working on sponsored variety shows, 
um, and we played places like the Palladium and some of the big variety theatres. And you had the most amazing variety acts. The ones that stick in my mind was Eric Delaney and his big band, which gradually got smaller over the years, and Eric bashing away at his drums, Cyril Fletcher, all manner of then household names. And dear Eric standing in the wings and always shouting, come on mum, when we did our cookery spot. But people used to come up from the audience and we used to, uh, used to make trifles with them and things and so I actually had to work on the preparation side for mother and then be on the stage to hand her a little like a nurse handing a surgeon the bits and pieces so I did that for a, for a relatively short while but it was a time when I could really actually understand how professional she was because everything had to be weighed to perfection every tray she would have planned how many spoons had to be on that tray how many pieces of grease paper of what size all of those sort of things i'd gone from ministry of food to manning the ministry of food bureau at harrods and i said you know people are asking for recipes why don't we do a recipe book and that was entirely done within harrods I cook the stuff in the morning in front of an audience, rush upstairs to the advertising department, and they start printing it. That was self done for Harrods. And I did two books, and pressure cookers came out. I did a booklet for pressure cookers as well. So those were my first real books. And then along came Paul Hamlin. And of course, Paul Hamlin had a great effect on my life because he was the biggest nag of, of getting you to do things you didn't particularly want to do. And I have a great affection for him, admiration. But he annoyed me more than most people I know. Um, and so he started, and what I didn't realise is practically, I got this from the management of, of Hamlin's, practically the whole of their capital went into cookery and colour. We've written three books that we have shared authorship of or shared ownership of in some way. She was asked to write um, a bibliography of cookery and obviously didn't have the time to do research and I had a fascinating time doing the research going to weird and wonderful places like the Russian Embassy when it was a very closed sort of community and asking for details on Russian cookbooks and we put together a splendid volume. We also worked on a fondue and tabletop cooking book but best of all, we produced one called Feeding the Kids, which was largely, because I wrote to a publisher, I had a daughter who would not eat a thing. Milk and Norwegian goat's cheese. Desperation. How could Marguerite Patton have a granddaughter that just wouldn't eat anything? So I wrote to the publisher, who I'd worked with in the past, you know, have you got any books on feeding children? No, but why don't you and your mother write one? What's his name? David, Elizabeth David, one well, has to. Wonderful writer, a rotten cook. <laughs> Her recipes don't work. I admire a lot of them. Obviously because I know him better than most people, I admire J.B. Oliver. Because he's a carer. And while I think he makes a lot of silly mistakes, and I've told him so, um, he does care about the public. Whereas most of them only care about their own glossy reputation. We weren't important. It was the food we prepared that was important. And we were steering people all those years. And remember, rationing went on for 14 years. Through those awful days, trying to inspire them to do things. So it was the, uh, the actual recipes, the dishes, not us. We didn't count. Many of chefs today that do this entertaining on television bit, uh, as well as doing their, the cooking in their own restaurants, I really don't know why they think they have a God-given right to be able to perform. Some of them are awful at it, but they don't do the right thing and go and watch a seasoned, a seasoned professional. And that, of course, is how 
Margarita was for me. She was a seasoned professional. And I think it's my father who, or perhaps it was somebody totally different, um, who said, well, you're the Stanley Matthews of the cooking world. You know, you've done it all when it's ten shillings a, a game or whatever. And then there was this new sort of wave, well, virtual tsunami of people that have come along. But I think what is smashing is that a mother is very friendly with them and they are to her as well. Um, I mean, she loves enterprising young people, full stop. So it's exciting to her and it's great to her to see anybody encourage the, the population to eat properly to eat sensibly, to eat things that are good but tasty and lovely. Her food has moved with the time, so she's learnt from them. Oh, but I, I think she thought I was okay. And I think she, I think she liked that I had kind of uh, some idea about uh, the roots of dishes and, and that I was very keen to kind of use everything. I think mm. she thought that I was, you know, a good egg. If you don't help people to survive, get a good meal for the family, which we all said, Gosh, that was nice. Then you're not doing your job. Did you have a special treat? Oh, we had roast chicken on Sunday. We all got enthusiastic about that. Chickens had a lot of flavour, were very good. Mother always did them with all the trimmings, the bacon rolls, the stuffing, the bread sauce, not cranberry sauce. Um, and everything that went with it, so it was a real treat. The other thing was a sort of birthday party where uh, you had a special cake. Now that was a treat. You see, we were easily treated in those days, simple things. What do you think is, or what is your favourite kitchen gadget? Oh, I would think a, a, a food processor, because it does much more than a mixer. I mean, I can't see the virtue of chopping things or something and do it for you. <laughs> Have you ever had a culinary disaster, absolute disaster, and what happened? Oh, I had to do a television programme about the things that go wrong. All sorts of things. There was the time when fresh eggs came up, so I was going to make a beautiful roulade or Swiss roll. I took great care to show how to fold things in, to warm the flour in the kitchen so that it's lighter. I went through it in great detail. And above all, make sure your oven is the right heat. And I'd forgotten to put the oven on. So I declare that I'm the person that originated. Here's one I made earlier, because I had made one earlier. And what foreign food do you like? I like a Middle Eastern. I'm very, very fond of Arabic food. Comfort food. Do you know if you're tired or not feeling Yes, ice cream. Mm. I love ice cream. Of all the recipes, uh, you know, in your life that you have um, produced and, and, and so on, do you have a favourite? Well, it's a favourite because it's tied up very much with the ending of Rashley, the ending of the war. In 1954, the BBC asked if I would do a pre-war Christmas pudding, a pre-war Christmas cake, and pre-war mince pie for the proper amount of fat, which I did. And uh, afterwards, they were demanded that they would uh, take me off straight away, because I and Winston Churchill, it's the nearest I've been to Winston Churchill, were leading the youth of Britain astray. He, because he drank alcohol, me, because I used alcohol in the cake, the pudding, and the mince meat. <laughs> so there you are. Any wish unfulfilled? No, not really, because I'd done what I wanted to do. I wanted to go on television, and I went on television. I wanted to appear on stages, and I've appeared. You can't have many more stages than I've had in my career. When This Is Your Life was filmed, it was, to me, a tremendous thrill that so many of them came to be with her. Yes, of course, producers can stand with guns to head, but these were enthusiastic people, and Gary Rhodes was only too happy to stage the surprise element, because it was cooking a lemon cake of some sort that had got him into cooking, and that had been from Mother's recipe. Nobody I knew said, I can't be bothered. We also become the coach, we're going to go, we're going to spend the evening, we're going to be there, because to pay tribute to that lady while she was still there, 
is fantastic. And I think, you know, the thing about, I go back to where I started, she knows her business, she's a professional, she's a great communicator, she's durable, she's taught many of us, inspired many of us, and I always, when I'm writing my recipes and I've got them in my mind formulated, there are two people I look at. One is a one is a, a, a trade reference book, and one is a margarita pattern book. And you always read to think, actually, okay, my recipe is not that close to hers, but actually, it's the balance that she's got. Because if it's out of balance, you know, it probably won't work. So for me, long live the girl, lovely lady. I think what she what she did and has done is to make sure that complete beginners, and I take my husband as one of these can actually follow one of her recipes and it will be perfect. Not dazzle, but make interesting food that people are going to enjoy eating. I think to sum up Marguerite Patton, um, I got an overwhelming feeling of a life with not one minute wasted. <laughs>